Okay. So, so Alan, then, so 35 years, that's a long time to be in any one place um, for a job. But I think you were involved with Pools Cavern before then, weren't you? So tell us a little bit about how you got started with Pools Cavern. Yeah, um, so I first became associated with this place back in 1976. I was a schoolboy at the Buxton College down the road. And um, every Thursday we had a, an outdoor pursuits group. And we were taking climbing and caving and canoeing and everything. And uh, on certain days we came up here and we, we helped with some conservation jobs. Okay. So we built picnic tables around here and we carried wheelbarrows full of gravel into the cave right. when the footpaths were being upgraded. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and during one of these sessions, me and a friend plucked up courage to go and ask the uh, Dave Allsop, who was the, being employed as the manager at the time, and he was also an electrician installing the cave lighting, if there were any jobs going. Okay. Um, and yeah, so we, we got trained up as the first cave guides. And Christmas 1976, on well, Boxing Day, um, Dave had just finished putting the lights in, decided to open the cave to the public as a a precursor to the full opening and um, I was uh, given the great honour of taking a, one of the first parties down the cave as a, a terrified 15 year old lad uh, with a group of about 60 people including my mum and dad 60 people. and I remember just <laughs> burbling my way through speaking at 100 miles an yeah, hour <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and even now when, when we take on new cave guides I, re, I, re, I sort of channel that experience and uh, remember what it must be like for them taking their first cave tour in. So you were actually working here before the cave was actually open to the public? Then? Yeah, so officially it opened in 1977 yeah, yeah, right. uh, with the, the Duke of Devonshire uh, laying the foundation stone and putting right. the plaque up, which we've, we've still got in the visitor right. centre. But the cavern actually opened um, Easter 1977. Right. And of course, Dave Allsop was quite a character, wasn't he? I mean, he must have been, he was a driving force behind Pool's Cavern. Um, I guess he must have had quite a big influence on you as well. Oh, definitely. He was very much a hero. He was um, a very well-known Buckstonian, if you like. Mm. He was uh, a, a well-known caver of international standing. He was in the local cave rescue team. He was the natural person to be offered the job here as uh, the warden. He was, uh, he was a well-known naturalist and conservationist as well as, as an amateur. Uh, and he previously worked in outdoor pursuits and um, uh, working for the Guild Guides Association and all right. sorts of uh, work right. like that. Um, so yeah, it was natural for him to get the commission to fit the electric lighting into the cave as a professional electrician and then, yeah. and then get, be given the job as the first warden. So I was very much in awe of him as a young lad um, and we had a great young team of cave guides here and he took us under his wing and used to take us caving and climbing and then go to the pub <laughs> afterwards yeah. so yeah, um, yeah it, and he was such a raconteur as well he had some amazing stories of his expeditions to France and caving in the 1950s and the 1960s when it was all very much people doing it with homemade equipment and yeah we were very much uh, very much in awe of the man um, and he, he was um, he was like you say quite a character he was also to be fair quite a difficult person at times to get on with uh, it was a very hard taskmaster, taskmaster, and um, and um, had very high standards, which yeah. I think those are the things I, I sort of learned which, from when I took which over. Which you've taken, you've taken on board from. And obviously, I mean, he he has set a very high standard for the cave, hasn't he? Which, oh, absolutely. Which you carried on. Absolutely passionate yeah. about caves, yeah. which is something that he uh, rubbed off on me at a very yeah. early age. Yeah. So that's, that's interesting because one of the things that strike that struck me about um, Pools Cavern is that it, it is a heritage cave. Mm. And that's something which you've been very keen to maintain. It's Definitely. The heritage side of it. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. Uh, and I think we, we've hit the, hit the right level, that mix between heritage and interpretation and education mm. and also tourism as, um, as a way of entertaining people. Mm. Um, but primarily we, we've always stuck to that main principle that we are here to educate and conserve yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the heritage yeah. of the cave. And of course, it's part of the heritage of Buxton. The, the cavern is very much part of the Buxton story from prehistoric yeah. times. Yeah, yeah. So I guess when Lismore Fields was occupied as a Neolithic site, they would have used Pool's Cavern perhaps as some sort of... Uh, almost uh, certainly, yeah. 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 You can yeah. almost imagine yeah. people trading, storing items yeah, yeah. in the cave, yeah. Yeah. Uh, staying overnight in there when they were hunting animals and yeah. so on. And yeah, um, yeah right through to the Romans yeah. worshipping and leaving offerings in the cavern. Yeah. You mentioned um, 
Dave also an experience as a caver, but you're also a very experienced caver yourself, aren't you? I mean, you've caved all over the world yourself. I um, have, yeah. Not so much nowadays. I'm getting a bit. Well, we all get a bit old. Bit achy for that yeah. sort of thing yeah. now. But yeah, yeah. In my younger days, I did do a lot of caving and uh, expeditions abroad as well. What was your favourite part of the world to go caving in? Uh, apart from Derbyshire. <laughs> apart from Derbyshire. Yeah. Um, oh, that's a difficult question. Um, I, I've been very privileged to have been to some really beautiful parts of the world which were very much off the, the beaten track uh, from a tourism point of view. Probably China, I would say, was, really? was, right. um, was something I was, I was very honoured to be asked to be part of a, uh, a British expedition, right. part of an ongoing project in conjunction with um, scientific universities in, uh, in China, studying the geology of, of various regions looking at the, the water courses and helping to plan uh, flood alleviation systems okay. and hydro, um, hydroelectric schemes uh, back in the 1980s and also understanding how water ran underground through the arid uh, areas that they wanted to uh, make more fertile right. and, and plant. So, um, yeah, and we had some amazing times out in the southern part of China, almost down to the Vietnam border right. Right. and explored some of the most beautiful and right. massive caves yeah. in the world. And so there was a strong scientific element to that work, which is interesting because you've now brought in um, cave scientists into Pools Cavern, haven't you? Yeah, it's something that's always really interested me, as a, as a, not just as a sport, mm. but also uh, the, the way that caves can record the planet's continuous, continual changes right? Um, and how it's recorded changes from the various ice ages. Uh, and when you understand a little bit more about the things that you can see underground as you as you walk through a cave, um, it really does open up like a book. The, right. the story of right. of the right. planet's change, and very much we're doing that in Pools Cavern with the scientific work that we've got involved in there, uh, which was very much involved with recording climate change from the weight, the rate that the stalactites are growing and the sediments that have been left by previous floods. And is that right, that the, the stalactites, they, they cut them open and they can see the ring, almost like rings of tree, like a tree ring? That's right, can, yeah. Right. So you can visibly see, because our stalactites are growing very quickly yeah. with the lime waste, some of the fastest growing yeah, stalagmites yeah. ever recorded. Um, so you can visibly see these annual growth rings, wow. these laminations, which are very much like the ring of a tree. Um, but a, a much older stalagmites taken from a cave, say in the Arctic parts of Russia, you can dissect that and yeah. look very carefully through yeah. a microscope and you can see the same laminations right. on a stalagmite that might be half a million years old. Right. So that's, that's a, a recording of every year's climate change over that period of time. And the chemistry of it that's locked into the rainwater uh, from different climatic periods, so for instance, if there's been volcanic eruptions yeah. and lots of ash yeah. has got into the atmosphere, yeah gets into drips of water and that gets locked inside the stalagmites as well. So it's so. a really important piece of, 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 uh, of research then, in, in the sense of understanding what's happened in the past. Absolutely is, yeah. it's, it's very cutting edge and I, I think that's probably one of my proudest achievements yeah. is, is bringing that collaboration between the cave science community uh, and Pools Cavern to be able to use this very beautiful, very accessible cave. Yeah. Um, cave scientists aren't always cutting edge potholers that want to go down the world's deepest caves. So to be able to have a cave that's so accessible yeah. uh, and, um, and so easy to, act, to, to get to the uh, formations without damaging anything, that uh, we, we've been able to have mm. this uh, research centre set up. And is this, this, is, this research is ongoing and it's global as well, apparently, because people from all over the world are, are, are able to access the information. So. Yeah, yeah, so we've got real-time uh, recordings which are downloaded to loggers, right. sent out over the internet, and right. anywhere, anybody in the world, any researcher in the world can download that information. And probably one of the best kept secrets about, about Buxton, really, isn't it? We, yeah, a lot, a lot so. of people know about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. They, they ought to, they ought to, because it's a fantastic yeah. achievement. Yeah, very much so. Cave has been one part of your responsibilities here, but the woods have been the other part. Mm. And I know you're very passionate about the woods. Mm. Uh, how, how do you feel about um, what's happening with Ash Dieback in the woods? And, and how do you think the woods will cope? And where do you think, if we were to sit here in 35 years' time, what would Grinlow look like, do you think? Yeah, it's funny, we were talking about that this morning. We've, I grew up in Buxton mm. and um, played in the woods as a young mm. lad 
Uh, there's probably still trees up there that have got my initials carved into them <laughs> in places. And, um, you know, uh, I can walk around the woods and recognise places where I played when I was 12 years yeah, old. It's right. still there. Yeah, yeah. Some of those trees are still yeah, there yeah. Um, that I, I carved my name onto. Yeah. And um, it, is, it is sad that the woodlands are, are changing because of these diseases. But we saw the, the onset of uh, Dutch elm disease back yeah. in the 70s. Yeah. And the woods have recovered from, yeah. from that very well. Yeah. There's still thriving elm trees in the woods yeah. um, where other areas were decimated. And I think in the future that elements of the woods will survive. I think the fact that trees are dying is part of the natural life cycle yeah. of the woods and regeneration is, is part of the nat well, natural course, when life the, cycle. When the trees die, they're actually, as you say, they're, they're part of the woods. So the, the, the dead wood becomes the food and the source of nutrients mm. for the for the next the next sort of generation. That's of right. And, yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and stuff. Yeah, and obviously, you know, replenishing the woods with um, natural, mm. homegrown species, yeah. which we're doing um, with the projects that we've got with stronger roots, is very much um, a way forward. I think because of course they're all plantation woodlands, aren't they? Mostly. They are. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's so right. Sense, they're not very. They're not very natural because the trees are all the same age and have grown up at the same. Yeah. Right. And yeah. it's it's long been identified, as you know, that yeah. uh, uh, this is always going to be a problem. That all the beech trees and all the sycamore yeah. trees are all growing towards the end of their natural yeah. lifespan yeah. anyway. Yeah. So we need to. Uh, open up these areas so that different parts of the woods can regenerate at different times. And of course, it's got triple SI status for mm. all those very those, those very glades. Isn't That's it? Which, right. Which, and I just explain a little bit about how, about the glades and how they how they fit into the sort of the ecology of the woods. Well, the the, the woodland glades, of course, are part of the old industry mm. of uh, lime burning on the hill, uh, and the glade areas, the the flat plateaus, are the results of the waste tips yeah. of probably over a million tons of waste lime that was dumped over many centuries provides a very very alkaline very poor thin soil right. environment which is absolutely ideal for some of the rare subalpine species of plants that we get particularly the, the species of orchids which we, we yeah. find in this region yeah. and where we are ge geographically in Britain we're at the southern limits of northern species of plants and the northern limit of southern species right. of plants and it, it's interesting with the changes in climate how we're seeing that creep of slight changes in this yeah, plant species yeah. something that uh, we can record in the future as well so again that fits in with the, the cave science in the sense of measuring climate change the the, the movement of the plants very much so also yeah does a similar thing yeah and the whole i'm sure the whole biodiversity yeah. of the hillside will yeah. slowly alter and that's no bad thing that's just a no. natural change that's going to happen and what's also you mentioned the industrial history of the, and that's interesting as well how the woods have recovered and, and it, it, it's quite hard to see when you walk in the woods to see the industry the archaeology that's mm. there but it's quite hard to notice it and if you think in a couple of hundred years time it's just swallowed it and unchanged yeah. transformed it yeah. which is a very hopeful thing for the future really, isn't it, it is it shows you how nature can that's right so when recover. you look at modern reclamation schemes you know and it, when you drive up the M1 and go past all the old coal fields yeah. which were yeah, yeah. landscaped in the 1970s yeah. and 80s yeah. and you can imagine what they'll look like in 100 years time yeah. it's yeah, it is encouraging yeah. it is very much encouraging so 35 years at Paul's Cavern the next 35 years then what's the plan <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know uh, I'm gonna take a bit of a back seat I think when I enjoy a long summer holiday um, I'll still be around I think I'll still keep popping back in for a cup of tea. Well we're going to invite you back to go and talk about Paul's Cabin anyway but um, oh yeah yeah for, for the members tour but Alan thank you very much indeed and all the very best for the future. Oh thank you very much. Cheers. Pleasure. <laughs>